Well, good morning, church family. We're so excited to worship with you. I'm glad to be back and be able to worship with y'all. If you would stand as I read our call to worship this morning. This morning, we're going to read from Psalms 47, and it reads, Clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to God with a jubilant cry, for the Lord the Most High is awe-inspiring, a great king over the whole earth. And I told this to first service, but I said I've seen a lot of worship leaders and worship pastors try to pull this verse to guilt trip people into clapping or to singing louder or to raising their hands. But that's not the point, right? I want to read this to show y'all that people have been worshiping God throughout history, right? We get to do that this morning, but they also did this hundreds and hundreds of years ago. But I do want to say if you feel led, right, if you feel a prompting of the spirit to raise your hands, maybe close your eyes or clap and worship, then follow that. Right, You're not doing that for the people around you. You're not doing that for us, but that's for the Lord. That's what you've been prompted to do. If you quench the Spirit here, it's going to be so easy to quench the Spirit when He tells you to go talk to somebody. Or it's going to be so easy to quench the Spirit when you feel like you should be in the Word and you're not. And so start small, but let's sing together and follow the promptings of the Spirit this morning. So let's lift our voices and proclaim the name of Jehovah who protects, who provides, Lord most high. Come on, we see this together. He shames every eye. He shames every eye.
Welcome. Uh, not a bad day to, way to start a morning, right? Amen. Telling God who He is and thanking Him for who He is. I pray you've been blessed so far, and this is going to be a great day. I, all that's going on tonight, as you saw with baptism this evening, that's always a very special time for our church family, and uh, we'll talk more about that later in the service. If, if that's something that God is doing in your own life, uh, we'd love to help you take that next step. Well, my name is Tim. I'm the campus pastor here, and if you're a guest with us this morning, we're glad that you're here and uh, I didn't get a chance to work the room. I typically work the room before service, and I got caught up in other combos. So if I didn't shake your hands, not because I don't like you. I see you. I love you. I promise. I just uh, didn't get a chance to work the room today, as I usually do. But if I didn't meet you afterwards, would you stop by and say hey to me on the way out today? I'd love to meet you and just hear what God is doing in your life and how we can come alongside you on your faith journey, okay? So let me encourage you to do that as well. Hey, listen, I'm going to have our, our, our ushers to come forward. We're going to give uh, a time of offering here in tithes. Uh, as they come, let me just again, as I always reiterate, uh, how God um, honors those who give cheerfully. God honors when we are obedient in this place. And it's, very, it's actually the only place in the Bible where God says, test me in this. Uh, meaning that he knows that this is one of the most difficult areas of our life, to, to relinquish our resources, to give away what God has given us. And by the way, all that we have is his, right? Uh, he gives us everything we have, and he gives us the abilities and the talents to, to make the money and pay the bills, but also, he says, just return back to me a tenth and uh, see what I'll do. And so, uh, again, thank you for being generous. Thank you for being faithful. It's really about being faithful. Generosity, quite frankly, is after the tithe, in my opinion. Right. Being faithful in the tithe is just being faithful. And so, thank you for doing that. Uh, God is using your gifts here, your tithes here, to expand work here and across the world and uh, you're a part of a bigger family of churches that, that we see just his impact because of your faithfulness. So thank you for that. Let's pray. And if you came prepared, by the way, to give, great. If you give online, continue to do so. If you're a guest with us, maybe let the pat play pass. There's no pressure on that. Uh, but we would love for our church family to step into this worship moment and give back to the Lord. Father, thank you so much for uh, all you give us. Thank you that all that we have is yours. And God, that you have given us our talents and our abilities and all the things that we have in order to, to be able to give back to you this very thing. And so I pray, God, you will find us faithful. God, as you always are faithful to us, I pray we'll be faithful to you. So God, take these gifts, these tithes, these offerings, use them for your kingdom's sake. Would you multiply them as Jesus multiplied the loaves and fishes, multiply these resources so that your gospel, you can be made famous here and across the world, we pray in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. Well, hey, listen, as we continue our time, I'll give you a couple quick announcements. Um, Yesterday, uh, we had our uh, membership intense. It was the first one we did uh, after the the summer, and many of you were there. In fact, if you look on the screen, you'll see all those who came from our campuses uh, for membership. Yeah, and uh, and then our next pick is our Crystal Beach crew. Where are we? Boom, there we are. Yeah. So, um, so, so thankful to be a part of a of a group like this to see people coming to Calvary, making this their church home. If that's something you're still considering, and maybe you say, oh, I, I missed this one because of something or whatever, we'll have another one coming up in October. The 20th of October, we'll be doing another membership intensive at the Clearwater Campus. So maybe mark your calendars for that. But if you are considering membership, this is the way to do it. And a lot of these folks who have come, they're learning what it means to be a member, and many of those joined yesterday. So we're so very thankful for that. Well, as we think about what God does in our midst, we know that he is always at work, right? Do you agree with that? Like God is always at work. He's always speaking. The the Henry Blackaby principle is this. God is always at work. We need to adjust our lives to get where he's working. That's the point. Sometimes we ask God, bless what I'm doing. And he says, do what I'm blessing. And so that's what God calls us to do in our journey in faith. And by the way, that happens all the time. You know this. Uh, we, go, uh, we go where God tells us to go. And sometimes that, dis- that destination is not where we thought we were going to go. Would you agree? <laughs> like, sometimes you're like, I think I'm going this direction, but God's like, no, 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 I want you to go this direction. In fact, we're going to talk about that this morning as we kick off this uh, new sermon series this week. We're talking about a man who was going on a journey, and God said, no, I'm going to have you go another journey. I-, I call it a divine U-turn. And that's exactly what happens, a divine U-turn. And so this morning, I want to celebrate a couple that has experienced that very thing. Now, I, I don't often do this as a church. Uh, we don't often just say to everyone who's leaving, let's have a moment. But what I love about this opportunity is we get to model what we believe God has told all of us to do, and that is to bless one another as God is giving them a divine new turn to say, I want you to go do and be and lead and serve. This couple, I'll just give you just a quick background. Some of you may know them. As soon as I bring them up, you go, oh, yes, I do know. This couple has been here with us for the last couple of years. They have loved and served and given and just put all of it on the table. Um, And I'm just so proud to have church couples, families like this here. I feel like we have a unique thing here, church. I really do. We're a family. And uh, it's exciting to be a part of a family and then see family go do something that God said go do. So this couple grabbed uh, George and I a couple weeks back and said, hey, can we have some time with you and share what God's doing in our life? I'm like, yeah. So we had just a coffee around the table essentially moment. And they shared what God was doing in their life. And I'm like, we, we got to get behind that. We got we to, gotta, as a church family, we got to bless that. And so I told them, I said, give me one more Sunday because I want to I wanna bless you and send you. So Jay and Tracy, would you all come up? Jay and Tracy Cormier. You guys know Jay and Tracy perhaps. J- Jay and Tracy, yeah, come on, give it up. Um, this, is, uh, this is such a beautiful couple. Jay has been invested in our men's ministry and has just really poured his life into helping men walk with the Lord. He's in like two or three different groups. Like the guy can't get enough Bible study groups, so he does it in other places. Um, Tracy has been integral in our women's ministry and our prayer ministry. Many of you have been witnessed uh, by her prayer over you. She has uh, gone to homes and made meals and given rides. Like this, this couple has really invested in the kingdom work here at Crystal Beach. And uh, they told me they had this divine U-turn moment. Uh, I won't tell the story. I'll let them tell you. Uh, but God, a very orchestrated, and I'll share this part of it. So George and I were out on our driveway looking at a rainbow. This was just a, a few weeks back. And uh, they were telling us this story. They were watching this same rainbow from a different place in Tarpon Springs. And God, in that moment, brought this divine appointment with a pastor, a local pastor, who they heard basically said, how beautiful God's rainbow moment. And it turned into a long conversation to hear about what God was doing in this church. And, and, and God, just by how he does this, says, I want you to go. I want you to go help this pastor. I want you to go help replant this church. And they're like, well, no, God, we're, we have a family at Crystal Beach. We're good. And he's like, no, 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 it's not about you, right? It's not about you. It's about my plan. And so God called them to go help replant a church here in Tarpon. And I know this, he's going to use, just like he's done here with this couple, he's going to use them mightily there. And um, yeah, praise God. You can clap, absolutely, yeah. And here's what I also know. Uh, uh, 
we may not like do ministry together every day. This is not like a Calvary plant. So, you know, like, I have a plant in the church in Tarpon Springs. No, but we're the church. We're the universal church. And someday, one day, when we're all standing before the throne, if you know Christ, we're all going to be there celebrating. It won't matter what name tag we're wearing. As long as we're following after the same Jesus, which these two are, and they're going to be helping plant a church that's going to tell the same gospel message to those who will hear, we'll be all celebrating together. So I'm so excited for this couple. I'm going to ask our deacon, Bob, any deacons in the room, would you come on up? I want to pray for these guys and commission them. Would you do that church with me? You're like, this is weird. If you're a guest, you're like, this is weird. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's family. This is what we do. We send, and we bless, and we, and we tell them, not only are we saying, check you out later, like, you know, it's not like a bias, see you later, but it's also saying we commit to pray for this couple too, right? We're committing as a church family to say, I'm going to pray for them as they go. And listen, I'll be honest, I'm selfish. I don't want them to go. I'm not going to lie. But God does. That's right. And God does. And that's, and that's enough for me. That's good enough for me. So would you just extend a hand? Would you just to commission these, these two uh, to just love them, pray for them, and bless them as they go. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for Jay and Tracy. God, you have used them in such a mighty way here at Calvary Crystal Beach. We are just uh, in awe of how you work. Um, if it was up to us, God, we'd be doing a whole lot of different things. I, I believe that. But when you're leading and you're guiding, uh, you are showing us. And sometimes uh, we're not listening. <laughs> Sometimes we're like, no, God, I don't want to do that. But Jay and Tracy said, no, God, we want to do that. And I think their prayer was answered. I think they pray this prayer every day. God, what do you want us to do today? And God, by your divine U-turn, there by the water, looking at a rainbow halfway across town, we were having that moment, not even knowing it, together, where you are speaking into their life and using this moment to draw them to help plant a gospel work in Tarpon. So God, use them in a mighty, mighty way. God, go before them. Give them favor as they reach out, as they do the work. There's hard work ahead, God. There's a lot of hard work ahead. But God, we look back just two years ago here and all the hard work ahead of us. And God, what you've done because of your faithfulness and goodness. So God, we ask you to do the same for this church. As they come alongside this pastor and his wife, would you give them encouraging words? Would you give them the support and prayer that they need? Would you give them all the resources they need, God? To replant a church is hard. It costs money. It requires a lot of effort. But God, you are already working in this couple's life, which means you're working in a lot of other people's lives too. So God, use them, bless them, encourage them. And God, as we see them around the town, around town at the local restaurants or the, or the Panera or Walmart, God, will we go over and hug them and hear about what you're doing? God, will we do that? Will we pray for them as they go, that we would not forget them? This is not just a one and done moment, but God, we would lift them up each and every day to just love and pray for them. And God, in doing so, we give you glory, we give you honor, we give you praise in advance for all the things you're going to do in this couple's life, in and through them in this church. And all God's people said, amen, amen and amen. Let's give it up for these guys. You're welcome. Love them, love them, hug them, tell them this story, let them hear the story. You guys go. Let's sing together. Y'all stand, let's sing together as we continue our work.
light the darkest places lift heaven's throne to chase us you are the way the truth and life you heal the deepest heartache you walked as love incarnate you take what's wrong make it right so we lift our hands with every breath we praise you lord because we believe jesus you're still the hope of the world cross that stands. Let's sing this together. There is a cross that stands in between God and man. You bridge the chasm made away. Your saving arms were spread.
Cause you're still the hope of the world. Father, we bow down before you. You sent us the hope of the world in Jesus Christ. The same hope of our fathers and our grandfathers. The same hope for our children and grandchildren. From time to time, you have been hope and peace in our lives. We are so undeserving of your grace and your mercy. Father, we lay our pride at the feet of Jesus. Father, we lay our agendas at the feet of Jesus. Our desires, our hopes, and dreams guide them. Show us what you have for our lives. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. You guys can be seated. I'm sure that we can agree that there's a difference, a big difference, between taking a trip and going on a journey. The thing about taking a trip, you know it's similarly like a business trip. You take a day or two away, you head to a destination city, you do a couple of hours of work, and then you come home. That's a trip. I'm taking a trip to the grocery store. But when I say I'm going on a journey, that means an entirely different thing, doesn't it? Sometimes that journey means I'm going to go for an extended period of time. I'm going to go to multiple places. I'm going to be, I'm going to be gone for a while, maybe months, maybe years, depending on the kind of journey that you're on. And over the next several weeks, we're going to be going on a journey. We call it a gospel journey. As we look at a man whose life emulates the life that God has called all of us to live on this thing called a spiritual walk or spiritual journey, like the person named Saw. And we're going to stop along the way, uh, lots of places. We're going to see all kinds of sights, hear all kinds of things. And the good news is, it won't cost you anything. You can sleep in your own bed at night, and your tour guide is pretty awesome. <laughs> you see, all of us are on a journey, right? We know that life is a journey. We know that each and every day is a step on that journey. And for some of us, we've been at the journey longer than others in this life. And for some of us this morning, that physical journey we know starts at birth, and we've been at it many, many years perhaps, but there's also another journey, a spiritual journey that starts at our, not our physical birth, but our new birth in Christ. In a similar way, it's mapped out over time. And God, miraculously, as we think about what He has done in our life as those who have come to faith, we know that the journey we may have been on was changed dramatically because Jesus showed up, and he put us on an entirely different journey. And that's what we're looking at this morning. And God invites not just only a man named Saul on this journey, he invites all of us. So would you turn there in your Bibles to the book of Acts? And over the next several weeks, we're going to be in the book of Acts and many, many different places along this journey. If you have a pew Bible, it's page 966. And if you would, flip over to chapter 9. I'm going to be reading where this journey begins for this man named Saul, starting in chapter 9 and verse 1. So if you would, in honor of reading God's Word together, would you stand? I'm going to read just the first nine verses of chapter 9, 
And you can follow along there on the screen or there on uh, your Bibles. It says this, Now Saul was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He went to the high priest and requested letters from him to the synagogues in Damascus so that he could find men or women who belonged to the way and he might bring them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he traveled and was nearing Damascus, a light from heaven suddenly flashed around him. Falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul said. I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting, he replied. But get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the sound, but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they took him by the hand and led him into Damascus, and he was unable to see for three days and did not eat or drink. Heavenly Father, thank you for the reading of your word this morning, and just as we've been in worship and singing back to you who you are, God, those very words are words of submission. We're asking you, God, not only to to reveal to us what it is you want us to do in this journey, but God, we're asking for you to give us the conviction and the courage to do it. And so, God, I pray that you will use your word being preached today to change us, to dramatically shift our lives on this journey called life, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, if you've been in church at all, you may know the character Saul. Maybe you know more than you think you know or less than you think you know. I'm going to spend just a little bit of time here giving you a backdrop of who this man is because I think often if we're not careful, we can go, oh yeah, I know that story. Yeah, I've heard it before. I heard it on a flannel graph once in Sunday school. No, there's more to the story about this man that I think you need to understand as it relates to this journey that God puts him on. So who is Saul? What happens next in this story? Well, let me give you just a biographical sketch of who this man is. First, we know he was born in Tarsus. If you read the book, you know he was born in Tarsus. That city still remains today in Turkey. Tarsus was an important city, a large city, known for its culture and its philosophy. This was no small backwater town. This was a very influential city. Saul was a devout Jew. His family was devoutly Jewish. And it's likely that they were well-to-do. We don't know what they did necessarily, but they were well-to-do because Saul had all of the education and all of philosophy and all of the training he needed which would have been unique to him compared to other Jewish boys. But he would learn the law. He would understand Greek philosophy. He would learn several languages. Most Jews wouldn't have that luxury. Most believe that Saul went to Jerusalem as a teenager, around the age of 15 or 16, where he studied under the renowned rabbi named Gamaliel. You may have heard that name before. He studied under Gamaliel, and we realize very quickly that Saul is a very smart guy, brilliant. He would rise very quickly through the leadership ranks there as he was being taught by Gamaliel. And as a young man, he would even become a Pharisee. Now, we don't know what age he was, maybe in his late 20s, early 30s, but he was, he was a young man. He would become a Pharisee. A Pharisee was a sect of Jewish leaders who oversaw the teachings of the Old Testament law. Traditions, customs, practice. Later, we believe, he would become a ruling member of the Sanhedrin, which was a big deal because the Sanhedrin was a council of Jewish leaders who had authority not only over Pharisees, but over the Jewish life there in Jerusalem. They were kind of like the governmental leaders from the religious perspective, if you will. In fact, in Galatians chapter 1, we read that, that Saul would be so advanced he would rise above his contemporaries in Judaism. He would like rise to the top. He was a a ladder climber, if you will. He became a religious zealot, even radical, if you will. He was even given a prominent place of authority as one who casted votes to persecute the early Christians. This is this young man. This is Saul. 
And like most Jews, Saul was trained in a trade. There in Tarsus, one of the booming industries was tent making. He would become a tent maker. That was not odd. Most Jewish rabbis would get a trade. That's how they paid the bills. Rabbis weren't paid to be rabbis. They had to learn a skill. That would have been common. Now, among the Greeks and the Romans, that would have been looked down upon because it was not esteemed as important. But among the Jews, very important. Something else you might want to know is that his singleness in Scripture is something of a mystery. The reason why it's a mystery is because we don't know if he was ever married or had kids. But most Jewish men, especially those who were leading in a role like him, in their early 20s would have been married and likely had children. And here's why. Because if you could not lead a family, you could not lead the local church. You could not lead the people you were leading. Now, we don't know the answer to this question. We never really do find out whether or not he was married or had children. It's pure conjecture that he did, to be frank. But it does make sense, perhaps, based upon the Jewish culture and the Jewish practice. Okay? I don't know. Maybe. Right? Maybe. And finally, what you ought to know is that he was not only a Jewish man, but he was a Roman citizen. Which, if you know anything about the Romans and the Jews of the day, those were not bosom buddies. They did not hang out together well. They didn't like each other. But with his, his stature in the Jewish community and being a Roman citizen, it afforded him special legal rights and privileges that not many Jews had. He was a man of social standing in the Roman world. He had authority as a Jew. His Jewish name, of course, is Saul. Obviously, we know that from the Old Testament, Jewish King Saul. It's a Jewish name. But his Roman name, many of which we know him by this morning, is Paul. Saul, his Jewish name. Paul, his Roman name. Now, with all of that in the backdrop, let's turn back to Acts chapter 9. Some of that has not happened. It still remains unknown based upon this text. But the year is about 34 AD. It's likely in the fall. We don't know exactly when, but in the fall, we think. And the man that we're introduced to in this passage, it says there in verse 1, he was still breathing threats and murder. Let that just sink in for just a moment. This is a bad dude. He is not the guy you want to go hang out with and bring home to mother. He's the guy who hates the Jewish believers. In fact, if you know anything about his story, we're first introduced to him back in Acts chapter 7, verse 58, where we see him standing over the brutal murder of a man named Stephen. Stephen was a Jewish convert. He had become a Christ follower. He was telling the world about this Jesus who was who was crucified and buried and rose again. He was telling the gospel, and people were coming to faith. And it says that Saul stood there, and people took their cloaks and their jackets off, and they laid them at his feet while he gave them permission to stone this man to death. Now, if you know anything about stoning, that is not the way you want to die. It is brutal. They're taking not little pebbles, they're taking rocks, fist size or bigger, and they're throwing it at the head of this man until he is bloodied and beaten and broken. And eventually he dies. Brutal. In chapter 8, verse 3, it says, Saul was the one who actually approved of it. He signed the letter. Yes, do that. And he watched it. Can you imagine watching it happen, let alone coming up on the scene? He stood there. It says later in that chapter that he would go on where he would go house to house pulling men and women out of their homes and arresting them, imprisoning them, and sometimes even killing them for following this same Jesus. He was bent on more. The implication here is that he is no one to be trifled with. If you know Jesus today, he's not the guy you want to meet in a back alley. He's the guy who wants you dead. He's wicked. He's horrible. He is a sociopath. Now you say, well, that's awfully harsh. Well, pretty close if you consider what those tendencies are. So upon approval, this Saul goes to the high priest 
He hates Christians. He's already witnessed Stephen's death. He's given permission to it. He says, send me to Damascus. Tell the religious leaders I'm coming, and I'm going to take everyone out of their homes and bring them back to Jerusalem and imprison them too. This is where he's headed. I'm going to go after the people, he says there, of the way. The word of the way was the way people identified Christ followers of that day. There was no Christian term of the day. People who followed Jesus were people of the way. You know where that comes from, right? John chapter 14, Jesus said these very words, I am the way, the truth, the life. Anyone who comes to me, or anyone who goes to the Father must come through me. So he is he essentially is going after the people who said, follow that way. I'm going to follow that Jesus. What's interesting to me is he's headed to Damascus. He likely went through Galilee. If you know about anything about Galilee, you know that much of Jesus' ministry was spent in Galilee. Can you imagine? Here's the, here's the scene. Here's a guy who, is, who sees these believers as an upstart heresy corrupting Judaism. He hates them. He's had people murdered and imprisoned. And now he's going through Galilee. It's like driving through the neighborhood of Jesus. And all the while, I can imagine him getting more and more angry, more and more disdain for the people he's about to go see in Damascus. This is the journey he's on. This is where he's headed. But it becomes something very different of a journey than he expected. You see, when God shows up on your journey, things change. See, Jesus shows up on this journey for Saul and everything changed. How many of you have been on a journey in your spiritual walk or even in your personal walk where you say, I was headed one direction and then God showed up? <laughs> right? You know how this works. I call those divine U-turns where God says, okay, I understand you're going in that direction, but I've got a better plan. I've, I've got this direction I want you to go. And Saul experiences that firsthand. We see this actually unfold three times in Acts. We see it in Acts chapter 9, chapter 22, and chapter 26. We often call this the Damascus Road moment. Even in the world today, if people say, I had a Damascus Road moment, what they're not necessarily saying is it was a spiritual moment. They're just saying something happened. My life was altered. It was changed. Something dramatically shifted in my life. But in this case, this was not just some moment. This was a transformational moment, a dramatic moment, a moment that took Saul in a completely different direction. And aren't you glad he did? You see, no matter where you are on this gospel journey, God is already planning. He already has a purpose. He already, listen, you don't have to come up with it. Just submit to it. We'll talk more about that in a minute. We consider what Saul went through. It's the same journey that all of us go through when we're, we're face-to-face with this Jesus. And some of you this morning have had that encounter. You know what it means to turn around. You know what it means to repent and follow after what Jesus wants for your life. But some of you this morning have yet to do that. And you're on a journey. All of us are. But God has a plan. And he wants to reveal that plan to you and to me this morning. To change not only Saul's life for eternity, but change yours too. Well, there in your notes, if you'd like to take notes this morning, I'm going to look at seven kind of steps, if you will, along this journey. And the first step we see here in Saul's life is that he heard from God. He heard from God. Acts chapter 9 verse 4 says, he fell to the ground. He heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? You see, God is always speaking. He's always got something to say. He speaks in so many different ways. You know this. The question is, are you listening? See, we often see where God will use an experience to get our attention. I often call these those moments where God has to knock us off our high horse. Literally, it happened here to Saul. He was knocked down. He was in the very presence of Jesus himself. The light blinded him. He was struck down. He was in awe of what had just happened. And God sometimes does that. It's a very dramatic moment. Some of you are going on a path to hell, and he said, I'm going to turn you around and go to heaven. Like he, You understand how dramatic those moments can be. Some of you have lived that. 
But some of you are like, well, I'm just going through life and things are hard and I'm really not sure what God's doing. Listen, God will allow those kinds of things to get your attention, especially as his kids. He's not going to let you keep on doing your thing if you're his kid this morning. But if you don't know him, maybe he's just prompting your heart like, hey, pay attention. I got something to say. Listen. I've often said it this way. Sometimes God has to put us on our back before we'll look up. Maybe that's your story. Maybe that's where you're living this morning. Other ways God speaks is not just through our experiences, but through his word. God's word is always speaking. This is his divine inspired word for you and for me. God's words here to Saul reveals his rebellious and hateful heart. He's like, why are you persecuting me? Interestingly enough, he's not saying, Saul, why are you persecuting the church? He says, why are you persecuting me? It's a big deal. A face-to-face encounter with the Almighty God through Jesus. Why are you persecuting me? In fact, this story being intimated in other parts of Acts, in chapter 26, where Paul is sharing his story of his conversion experience, Saul hears these words in the, in the, in the passage there, and I think it's the King James Version or New NIV Version, but it says this, is it hard, coming from God to Saul, is it hard for you to kick against the goats? Some of you who were raised in a traditional Baptist home like me, that's what I remember this verse saying. Like, what is kicking against the goads? What is that? Well, a goad, you've heard the word goading you, right? Goading you to get in a goad direction. I'm goading you to do this or goading you to do that. The same word there, goad, is a cattle prod. And so when you think about livestock, you think about trying to keep everything in right direction and right sequence, the, the cattle driver or whoever's driving that herd would have a cattle prod or a goad. It would be a stick with a point on it. And if that cattle got out of the way or that sheep got in the wrong direction, they would poke them in the back of the legs to push them in the right direction. That was the goad. And what, what God was saying to Saul is, I've been poking you in the back of the legs and you keep kicking against the goad. You're rebelling. I've been speaking all along. You've been doing your own thing. And you keep rebelling and kicking against my prodding. Are you tired yet, is what God was saying. Are you tired yet of kicking against the goad? The same could be true of you this morning. Are you tired yet? Is God poking you and prodding you and trying to get you in the right direction? You just keep rebelling and kicking and God, I don't want to do that. I don't want to go that direction. And by the way, listen, people hear that and they go, oh, he just wants to be in control of my life. Well, yes, that's true. Amen. Yes, that's, what, that's why you call him Lord. Right. He's not just your Savior. He's a Lord. But here's the other thing you have to understand. The prodding was not just to keep them in line. The prodding was to keep them from out of trouble. Because they didn't know any better. They'd run into a ditch if they weren't being prodded back onto the trail. So, so God is saying, I've been prodding you all along. Are you done yet, Saul? God is speaking, and Saul listens. He hears. And my question to you this morning is, what God is saying to you? What is he saying? You know it. He knows it. You've been kicking against the goad. Or are you obeying? Are you submitting to his authority? And upon conviction here in this story, we see Paul, or Saul praying to God. He not only hears God, but then he prays to God. He asked two very important questions, and I will turn back to the King James Version on this one because I love how this explains verses 5 and 6. See, Saul hears and he prays these two prayers. Who are you, Lord, and what do you want me to do? What would you have me to do? The, The question, who are you, Lord, is a moment of humble acknowledgement, like, who are you? See, I don't believe Saul, Saul was done in anger. I don't believe God was like, Saul, Saul, blah. I think it was done with emotion. I believe it was like, Saul, Saul. Think about it when you're disciplining your children. You're like, Saul, Saul. No, you're like, come on, man. What's going on here? You're, you're persecuting me. You're killing, like, you're killing me, Smalls. You've heard that, Right? <laughs> You're persecuting me. Saul, listen up. And in that tender, tough moment, it's not an easy moment when God calls us out. 
And he uses Saul, Saul twice, I think, to get his attention. Like, did you hear me? I said your name twice. Pay attention. But that God would say, I've been prompting, I've been speaking, and you're just kicking against, do you really want to know me? Because I'll show you. When he says, who are you, Lord? He's really asking the question, show me you, Lord. Some of us this morning may just need to say, just show me yourself. Show me yourself, Lord. I don't know. I don't know what's going on, but just show me. The Bible says, if you seek me with all your heart, the Bible says, you'll find me. So are you asking the question, who are you, Lord? The knocking on your door is the Lord saying, will you let me in? That heart, that conviction, that moment of, hey, I, I want to dine with you. I want to be with you. I want to have a relationship with you. If, are you kicking against the goad? Are you saying, okay, come on in. I want to know you. I want to know who you are. But secondly, he asks, what do you want me to do? This is the hardest question I've ever asked God in my life. Because you better be ready for the answer. And it may, be, it may not be the answer you want to hear. Listen, I know sometimes, I was sharing this with Jay and Tracy, they weren't thinking like, let's go find another church. <laughs> in fact, they even said the hardest part of this journey was to say goodbye to this family. But God, I've got this great family, this church in Crystal Beach. I have all these friends. I have this ministry. Are you sure you want me to go? Yeah, this is what I want you to do. This is what I want you to do. Yeah, but no, no, no. I want you to do this. And for some of us this morning, we've been kicking against that. We know God is calling us. Some of you are being prompted to go to Safety Harbor when we launched this fall or this, this spring. You're like, I don't know. Okay. He won't let you sleep until you figure it out. If he's calling you, you better go. You better go. And I was, t- I was telling Pastor Nate, who's going to be pastoring that church, I said, you can have as many people from Crystal Breach as you want, just as long as I can choose them. <laughs> you may not make that list. I'm not really sure how that works. But listen, I know this. When God says go, it's not always comfortable. And by the way, it's not supposed to be. Because if it's comfortable and it's easy, then it's not God. Because he wants you to depend on him. He wants you to do the hard stuff for him. We we tend to think, well, I'll kind of make it my own and make it easy. No, no, no. That's not how it works. In fact, I think sometimes when we pray these prayers, I think we ask God to do for us when we should be asking God, what do you want us to do for you? So Saul asked that question, and we, we see there that his prayer doesn't end there on the road. If you go to verse 11, we see a man by the name of Ananias who is called by God to go to where Saul is. And in verse 11, it says, get up and go to the street called Straight and to the house of Judas and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul since he is praying there. So he's praying. It says there in the Bible he couldn't eat, he couldn't drink for three days, he was praying, he was blind, physically blind. And, and Saul, and, or excuse me, Ananias hears from God, this godly man who says, go to that guy's house. Go to this house and see the guy named Saul. Now, don't forget who Saul is. Don't forget he is a murderous, horrific man. Don't forget the news of him being in Damascus had probably spread all through the neighborhood. They all knew he was there. They didn't know what was happening. They just knew who this guy was. And his, his per, the perception of who he was was scary, right? Terrifying for the people that were in his wake or in, in, his, in his sights. And so Ananias goes, which, by the way, it'd be like me telling you to go to a local neighbor's house of a known terrorist who hates you and wants you dead. Go have coffee with him or her. That's what's happening here. God says, go have coffee with that guy. Go, have, go, go see that guy. And aren't you glad Ananias obeyed? Because he does. And it says there, Saul took his next step. He believed in God. It says there in verse 17 and 18, Ananias went to that house. He entered it. He placed his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road you were traveling, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And at once, it says, something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Ananias says, God told me to come here for you, Saul, It's time to change direction. Paul immediately gains his physical sight, right? But it was way more than that. 
In fact, if you read that scales fell from the eyes metaphor throughout Scripture, you know what that, that is about? That's about your spiritual eyes being opened. When the scales come off, when the hardness of our hearts become tender, when we are able to receive the truth of the gospel. You see, Saul came to a physical sightseeing day today on this moment, but he became spiritually insightful because of what happened here. That coming with the Holy Spirit in him is a decision-making moment. You see, when you come to faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit of God resides in you. This was not some imparted thing. Saul received salvation. He received the Holy Spirit, and his life would never be the same. One commentator said it this way, In three days of blindness and deprivation, Saul was dying to himself. It would only be after three days of dying that he would receive resurrection life from Jesus. That's what happened. And by the way, truth, all of us this morning in this room were born into this world blind. We were all born blind. We all had spiritual blindness before Jesus. And some of us have blindness today, and we don't even know it. There's all kinds of blindness. There's irreligious blindness, which simply says, I don't need God. I'm in control. I'm large and in charge. I don't need religion. I don't need Jesus. I don't need anybody telling me what to do. It's my life. I'll do what I want to do. That's the lie of all lies. See, the lie is the enemy tells you you're in charge. You're in control. You're not in control of anything. God's in control. Oh, you have this idea that you are, that you don't need God. But the fact of the matter is you're not better off without him. I would often say it this way. People ask me, well, I, why would I need God? I have all this stuff. I would ask, well, how's that working out for you? I mean, do you have peace? Do you have joy? Do you have happiness? Do you have love in your heart? Do you, do you find uh, comfort in those hard times? How do you do this without God? I talked to somebody earlier in the service this morning who's going through a loss of a spouse and a, and, a, and a dad. I'm like, how do you get through these moments without Jesus? I don't know how to. But irreligious blindness is a big deal in our culture. A lot of people say, I don't need God. I'm all good. There's also religious blindness, not just irreligious, but religious blindness, meaning we believe we've done good enough. I've been in church all my life. I've done the thing. I throw money in the plate. I've served. I've given. I've done this. I've done all the good stuff. If I can just tip the scales in the, in the right direction, I'll have enough, and God will look at me and go, wow, look how great you are. Look how great you are. You can come to heaven now because you're such a good person. Can I just tell you on your very best day when the, tips, the scales are tipped in all the right direction in the good ca category, it's still filthy rags in the sight of a holy God? Right. Until Jesus Christ infiltrates your life, until God can look at you and see Jesus in you, you're still a sinful wretch like me. But man, the day I see, said yes to Jesus changed everything. The day that Saul said yes to, to Jesus, it changed everything. Martin Luther calls that kind of blindness the evil of our good deeds. Fact is, none of us are good enough. All of us need Jesus. And God, through his son, extended grace to you and to me, sending Jesus to die on our behalf, to take on our sin on the cross, to make us new and whole and set us on a gospel journey if we would just choose to receive his grace. Once one has said the acronym for grace stands for God's riches at Christ's expense. Another way to think of it is this way. You don't have to be good at being good for God to love you. It's not about trying, but trusting. It's not about your success in doing, but your faith in what has already been done. Well, it doesn't stop there for Saul. He's converted. He comes to faith, and it says there, step number four, he was baptized. Chapter 9, verse 18, he says he got up and was baptized. When he told his own story, in Acts chapter 26, I think it was, or 22, one of the two, he's telling his story about what happened, and he says, yeah, let me tell you the story. What Ananias said to me, Ananias said, why delay? <laughs> why delay? Get up and be baptized. Saul comes to faith, and Ananias goes, all right, let's go. It's time to get baptized. And my question to some of you this morning is, why delay? You see, when we get baptized, church, this is not a this is not an act of salvation. You are not saved by getting wet. If that were the case, every shower you take would make you saved on a Sunday morning. The baptism waters are an example, and a model, a, an outpouring picture of what God has done in your life. Saul did not go get baptized without being converted. 
In fact, in the Scripture, we find that every time someone is baptized, it's after that conversion experience. And it's by immersion. Now, I know you come, many of you come from different traditions, and I understand that some of you would say, well, I was baptized as an infant, or I was baptized as a child. I was dedicated. I went through confirmation. I would not downplay those things, but I would just say this. One, do you remember doing that? Most of you would say, well, no, I was an infant. I wouldn't remember that moment. So who was that moment for? It was for your parents. Your parents who committed you and dedicated you and said, God, this is my daughter. This is my son. I'm I'm giving them to you. You do what you would want to do with this child. That's what they were doing. It was for them to commit you to Jesus, to the Lord. And as you grow in your own understanding, as you understand what God wants to do in your own life, you come to faith at some point, right? You you make a decision to follow Jesus in faith. That's what Saul did here. We see it again in in Acts chapter 16 where, where the Philippian jailer and his family were saved. And Paul says, all right, let's go get baptized. Like this happens on and on throughout the scripture. You see, our statement of faith is this. We believe We believe this is what the Bible says. I'll just read it. It's our statement of faith on baptism. Christian baptism is the immersion of a believer in water in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You have often heard me say, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You hear me say that. That's why I say it. It's in His name that I baptize you. It's not me or your parents. It's It's the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's an act of obedience symbolizing the believer's faith in a crucified, buried, and risen Savior. Now watch this. The picture of baptism is metaphorically showing those things. In that moment, you are dying to sin. You're being buried under the water. And then you're raised to walk in newness of life. It's the very picture of the death, burial, and resurrection. That's why we do it. It acknowledges what God has done in you publicly for all to see. Some have asked me, well, should I get baptized now that I've come to faith on my own? And the answer is yes. The answer is yes. That decision was based on your faith decision to follow Jesus. And many of you have. I have baptized many of you out here in this water right here. And you couldn't be at a greater Sunday to do it today. Why delay? We're baptizing at the same key tonight. So some of you may be needing to take that step this morning on your journey. It really is the first step of obedience. Don't delay. Profess Christ. Publicly proclaim that through the waters of baptism. You can tell us today. We would love to help you take that next step. That's our hope and prayer for you. I've talked to some of you. You said, I think that's what I want to do. Praise God. You come forward at the end. We're going to do that here shortly. But it doesn't end there. So Paul, or Saul's story doesn't end there. It ends with the final work of his ministry. We'll talk about that over the next several weeks. But Look what happens on step number five here. The Saul then gathers with other believers. So he gets saved, he gets baptized, and he finds a community, and he spends some time there. Verse 19 of chapter 9 says he was in Damascus for some time. We don't know how long some time was. We think even maybe years he was there with that church, with that community, finding community in that group. Now, here's an interesting thing you need to remember. These same people he was in uh, community with were the very same people he wanted to kill before. So imagine that, uh, like, okay, you, you sit on that side of the room, I'll sit on this side of the room, you know, moment. But he's there hanging out with believers. Can you imagine Saul's story without Ananias? I can't. Can you imagine Saul's story without a guy named Barnabas, like a guy named Barnabas who came later in chapter 9 who, who said, hey, guys, listen, this is that guy I was telling you about. He came to faith. They're like, no, 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 not that same Saul. No, it's the same Saul, I promise. And Barnabas was the one who helped pave the way for him to connect into going on mission. He would meet with other believers. Listen, you can come on a Sunday, and I love that you're here. I'm preaching to the choir. You're in a body of believers. But it's more than that. It's finding community. It's finding relationships. It's connecting with others in walking this thing called out life. And all of us need friends like that. We all need people we can call on and pray for and be prayed over and be missed when I'm not here, and all those kinds of things. You know this. If you've been in community at all, you understand what this means. This past week, we started with new groups for the fall semester. We launched nine of our 12 this 
last week. We had over 150 in total in all of those attended, which I thought was fantastic. I was like, praise God, that's fantastic. But you know what? I started doing the numbers. 150 is really about 50% of the adult attendance in this church. Like we have about 320, 330 adult attendance every Sunday. So less than half, quite frankly, are involved in some level of community, whether it's a Bible study group or a community group or a women's discipleship group or whatever group. Now we're launching three new groups this next week. So there's really no excuse not to find community. I guess the whole point of this is find community. How else are you going to do this thing? I don't know how you do it in isolation. We're not meant to be in isolation. We're called to do it together. Saul modeled that. He would do that time and time again. He would go and plant churches so that people could be in community. Okay? Step six, he grew spiritually. It says there in verse 22 of chapter 9 that he grew stronger and kept confounding the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. That word stronger there is the word dunamis in the Greek. Same word we get dynamite and dynamic from which means that the spiritual growth, spiritual maturity should be dynamic. It should ever be coming, ever more powerful, ever more growing, ever more making a difference. As with anything worth doing, we know it requires work to do that, right? It takes commitment. It takes discipline to continue to grow stronger in our faith. What's interesting to me is that Saul grew stronger and he was confounding the Jews. This is why he was confounding them. The very thing he was against is what he's preaching for. He was confounding them, like, wait, 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 no, you were telling us all along that wasn't the right guy. Now you're saying he is the Messiah? What is going on with you right now? Because he was growing so deeply in his walk with Jesus. He understood differently, with different eyes. He saw the right picture. Listen, if you want to grow in your faith, you got to work. you got to spend time. you got to learn. you got to be in his word. The spiritual disciplines of Bible study and prayer and community and giving and serving, all of those are, are ways that we grow in our faith. If you want to be a better ball player, you have to practice. If you want to be, be better at your, your health, you have to eat better and work out. And if you want to learn more in school, you got to spend the extra time and studying. Like You understand this happens in every facet of your life. If you're at work, guess what? You want to climb the ladder, you got to work harder. you got to do more than the guy next to you or the girl next to you. That is the same way in our spiritual journey. Why would it be any different? In fact, this is worth your entire investment of life on. All this other stuff will pass away. This will not pass away. So he grew stronger, and finally we see there, last, he shared the message. He confounded the Jews. He would take this message of the gospel, and he would go and tell others. This would be the launching pad, if you will, of his work, to go invite others to join him on this gospel journey. In chapter 26, verses 17 and 18, God says to him, I am sending you to them, talking about the Gentiles, all the nations, I'm sending you to them to open their eyes. Hey, Saul, what I did for you, I want you to go tell others how that happened for them. Open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may too receive forgiveness of sins and to share among those who are sanctified in faith by me. Saul, what I did for you, you're going to go tell others to do the same. Invite more. Listen, when you read the New Testament letters, you know his entire life would be committed to this very work. He would go, and we'll see this over the next several weeks, place to place to place, investing, serving, telling, sharing, inviting people to faith in Christ. You see, Paul's name did not change on the road to Damascus. Many times you hear that in in the church like, oh, Saul got a new name. No, no, no. He always had the name Paul. He just started using his Roman name now. You know why? Because he started going after those who were not Jews. He stopped using his Saul name and started using his Paul name. My middle name is Ian. I don't go by John, but that's John. That's what Ian is. Similarly, Saul among the Jews was Saul. But now he's going to the Romans and the Greeks and those who are not Jews, and he's using his Roman name. No longer was he the great persecutor, but he becomes God's great preacher. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, it says, I have become all things to all people, so that by any possible means I could save some. And why do I do this? For the sake of the gospel. For the sake of the gospel. 
See, it's impossible for us to quantify all the impact of Paul's ministry. And we would try, we could, but I would say this. Look around the room. We are, by extension, a result of Paul's ministry. We all have received that great salvation that Saul experienced that day when Ananias laid hands on him and he received Jesus. And if God can save a man like Saul, he can save you. There's no, listen, I've heard people say, well, yeah, but you don't know my background. You don't know what I've done or, or said. or it does, Saul, come on. Anybody want to uh, try to duke it out with Saul here on your biographical sketch and say you're, you're worse than that? I can't imagine a person worse than this. And yet God, by his providential grace, saves this man, turns him around, and now we sit here under the teaching of the truth of the gospel, under his example, so that others might learn to do the same. See, when you know the gospel is true, and you know that Jesus really is who he says he is, as Lord and Savior, it's when God then says to you, it's time to take that turn, and he sets you on a gospel journey, and for you, your life is never the same. For some of you, you know that story all too well, and others, maybe today, maybe today is your Damascus Road moment. You know, in um, the book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis uses all kinds of metaphors when it comes to the conversion moment, that salvation experience, that moment when we become a believer, passing from death to life. He says this, it's like laying down your rebel arms and surrendering. It's like saying sorry and laying yourself open or turning full speed astern. It's like killing part of yourself, like learning to walk or to write. It's like a drowning man clutching at a rescuer's hand, like a tin soldier or statue who comes alive, like waking up after a long sleep, like getting close to someone or becoming infected. <laughs> it's like emerging from the womb or hatching from an egg. It's like a compass needle swinging to the north or a cottage being made into a palace. It's like a field being plowed and re-sown. It's like coming around from an anesthetic. It's like coming in out of the wind. It's like going home. Going home. You see, God's purpose for you and for me all along has been to go home. As the prodigal son's father stood at the door waiting for his son to come home, the Heavenly Father, the Creator of the universe, the God of all things, says, I want you to come home. He created you on purpose. He created you for a reason. He created for a relationship that you and He could have for now and eternity. And Saul learned it, experienced it, and he responded to it. What will you do with what you've heard? God says, come home. And for some of you, that means today. Would you bow your heads with me as we close this portion of our service and here's what I want you to do as we continue our team is going to come up and sing here in just a moment a very popular song all of us in this room likely know entitled Amazing Grace Amazing Grace and listen His love, His grace is amazing it gives you life, it gives you hope things we talked about this morning. It's all the things we sung about earlier this morning. And for some of you today, today is the day where God is speaking and you're listening and you need to respond. For some, it's saying, God, I'm on the wrong journey. I've been on the wrong journey. I've been on my own journey. And I am now, because I'm asking I'll do what you ask me to do. I'll be on your journey. I'll come to faith. You may simply say these words of, to God as, as, as Saul prayed, Who are you, Lord, and what do you want me to do? Pray those words this morning. He'll show you. If you don't know him, the very first thing he wants you to do is to know him personally. Not about him, 
not tell stories about him, but to know him personally. What does that mean? That you're walking with him. You have a personal relationship with him. That you've said yes to him to be your Lord and Savior. Perhaps today is that day. The day of salvation. And if Ananias were here, as I would come to you, I'd say, God has sent me to you today to share this good news. Now, what will you do with it? For others in the room this morning, you've not taken that very next step of obedience through the waters of baptism. Oh, sure, you had this thing back as a child, but since then, you've made a faith decision. You've come to Christ on your own. My story is very similar. I came to faith at a very young age. I didn't understand it. All I knew is I didn't want to go to hell. And I made a decision in fear as a child. I was baptized as a six-year-old. And quite frankly, I don't remember all of it. I just remember I didn't want to go to hell. That's all I remember. But at the age of 11, God showed up on my Damascus road. He said, Tim, are you tired of kicking against the goads? You've been doing this thing, this religious thing. It's really not yours. You've never really said yes to me. You said yes to a, a fear, but you didn't say yes to me. I remember going to my parents and saying, I believe God is calling me to be a follower of Jesus. And they went, you already are. I said, yeah, I don't think so. It's not mine anyway. Maybe it's your religion, mom and dad. I, I've, I've kind of been on your coattails for a lot of years, but I don't know if it's mine. And so I professed Christ at the age of 11. And I got baptized. You know why I did it again? Because it was that moment when I placed as a person a young man before God, my relationship and commitment to him. And I wanted to put a stake in the ground on that day to say this is the day that I follow Jesus. Maybe that's your story. Maybe you need to step into faith in the waters of baptism to say that to the world. This was the moment that I made Jesus my Lord. Not some religion thing, not some ritual thing, not something my mom and dad thing, but my thing where I said yes. That may be your commitment today. We would love to help you take that next step too. So here's what I'm going to do. We're singing the song. We're going to have you stand here in a moment. We're going to sing Amazing Grace. And I'm going to ask you to come. Come right down here. Meet me. I'll be on the floor here. Come down here and meet me right here. And you tell me what you want God to do in your life today. You want to be saved? Come. You want to get baptized? Come. You want us to pray over you for something you're going through? You come. This is the invitation. God is speaking. Are you listening? And are you willing, as he told Saul, to go to a place that I will show you and tell you what to do next? This is your do next minute. This is your do next moment. Let's sing together. Would you all stand? You come as God leads you. Don't delay. As Ananias said to Saul, don't delay. You come.
God's prompting your heart right now, don't delay. Do it now. This is the time. Moon and stars land. Morning sun is The Savior of the world was born. His body on the cross. His blood poured out.
God is doing in your life, if you say, well, I'm just not ready yet, I'm not really sure, listen, if God is prompting you, if he's knocking on the heart's door, man, don't delay. This is what I know. The first step is always the hardest step. It always is. It doesn't matter what you're doing in life. That new job, that new relationship, that commitment to follow Jesus is always the hardest step. You know why? Because you've got to depend on Jesus in that step. You've got to trust him. It's not going to be in your control. It's not in your power. It's his. And if he's drawing you today, he's drawing you to do something you've not thought about. Maybe you just, oh, man, I've got to do that. Yes. God's calling you, yeah. Yeah, but Tim, I know, it's hard. Yeah, I know, I get it. But you're never, ever in a better place other than being in the middle and the center of God's will for your life. He has a plan and a purpose that's better than what you think, can imagine. And he's not done with us, church. Listen, if you've been on this journey for a minute following Jesus, your journey's not over. There's more for you to do. Maybe it's getting a community. Maybe it's serving. Maybe it's giving. Maybe it's telling people about what Jesus has done in your life. There's more to do, church. I'm going to stay up here. I usually go out there and I meet guests. If you want to come and see me up here, I'd love to do that. But I'm going to stay right here. Our team will stay up here. If you still want to pray, you need someone to come alongside you, you made a decision, you're like, I just wasn't ready to do it, but I'm ready to do it now. Listen, I'll hang. We'll hang here. I don't want to belabor the point this morning. I want God to do his work, and then we're going to join him, okay? So we'll do that. Let me close this in prayer. As we head out today, listen, stop by Connection Hub if you have any questions. We we'll to be baptized tonight. Let someone know. Let me know. We'd love to get you on that list for tonight. We'll be out at Sand Key Park early, 530-ish, give or take. Starts at 6. Listen, church, come out and celebrate with those who are being baptized. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing to watch others come to faith and walk through those waters together. I'll be there. All of our pastors will be there. Pastor Willie will be there. We'd love to see you out there just to celebrate life change. Father, thank you. Thank you as we sing hallelujah, as we, think, we sing the, that the stone was rolled away, that you are glorified because now you're exalted to the right hand of the Father. You are not a dead God. You are a living, breathing God. You have given us life and life eternal by your Son in faith. And you've given us the Holy Spirit to go out and live out the things we've heard today. So God, for those in the room who have already professed you, who said yes to you at one point in their life, who have, who have taken the step of obedience, God, would you show them what it is that you want them to do? May they pray that prayer as Saul prayed. God, who are you and what do you want me to do? For others this morning who maybe are kicking against the goads, they're kicking against the prods of your spirit. God, may they not rest until they get that part right. It's no fun getting poked in the back of the legs when we're going the wrong direction, but God, you do it because you love us and you have a perfect plan for us. For some of us, we just need to relinquish control and say, yes, I will submit to your authority. I will take this next step as hard as it may seem. So God, go before us. We thank you for life change. We thank you for those who will walk through those waters tonight. For all those who have said yes to you, I pray a blessing on them. Go before us now. As Saul was to share the truth of the gospel journey with others, may we do the same, bringing others to life change because you've called us to. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a great day. We'll see you next week.